Lobby. <laughs> lobby for lobby gobblers. Yes. is situated in the Alston coalfield up in the North Pennines. And though Alston's in Cumbria, the, the pit itself is actually over the border in Northumberland. And it's situated above the banks of the South Tyne here. And if we're driving down the Alston to Brampton Road, which is here, you can look across and see Barrath Colliery, the remains of it. The, the barn is still there. That's Barrath Hall, and this is Barrath Park. And last, the last video, we went and looked at the old Barrath Colliery up in uh, Blackclough, up here, right the way up towards Horseman's Ford up there, and uh, the old coal pit into the um, Coal Clough Coal up there. We've zoomed in a little bit more. There's there's Barrath, there's a pit, there's a little pit road. That's the Scarberry Drift, Dryden's old original drift, and the one that's on the 1840, uh, 1865 map, and there we've got Barrath Hall. So let's go and have a good look round. We're going to start with a continuation of the history of Barrath Colliery again now. We did part one last year, the Dryden project. So this is going to take us from the 1950s up until the year 2000. Uh, and this is the edge of the Barrath estate. This is where Dryden's estate started. It goes a lot further back than uh, Dryden though. So this is Barrath Park. We're on the South Tyne in Northumberland. So can you tell you my sort of history with the place? Um, back in 1989, me and my then wife came up on holiday to Melma Bay and we stayed in a cottage there. And I got to know a lad in Penrith, Stewie, who told me that there were coal pits up at Alston still working. And at the time I was working at Grime Bridge. So I came over to have a look. Uh, and believe it or not, I actually drove past Barrow. I, I went to look at the others, I, I looked at Ale, photographed it, Clargill, I think I went up to Blagle, can't remember, and somebody in Olsen told me where Frank Shepherds was, and I drove past it, it <laughs> you couldn't really see it. I turned around at Barrath and came back and I saw the, uh, I saw the, the exhaust pipe of the compressor coming up through the roof, because the pit was built to blend in with the surroundings, that was part and parcel of the planning permission. Now, I kind of found myself uh, <laughs> out of work, a couple of years later, uh, I'd been in a printer's after the Grime Bridge closed and then ended up at another pit over there. Um, and I kind of thought, well, I want to get back into mining again. And I remembered meeting Frank when we'd been up here on holiday. So I rung him up to see if I could, uh, if there any chance of a start. And he told me to come and have a, have a day. Is that your best interview? See if you can actually manage. So I did, I came up on a Saturday morning and my wife went looking for us for somewhere to live. But, sadly, there was no job at the end of it, uh, which was a bit of a, a downer, really. Uh, he set his, I think, either his son-in-law or his son on again. Never mind. We put our house up for sale. We lived in a, like a park home at the time. And we thought, well, the first thing is to sell the house and I'll go back up there and see if I can get a job. Because there was lots of other pits, it wasn't just Frank's. There was at least another five calories at the time. So that's what we did. And it took six months, <laughs> believe it or not, to sell, the, to sell the, the mobile home. And we sold it on the Thursday. And on the Saturday, we came up to try and find a house. And we, we found what, the house that we moved into, the cottage in Narsdale, on the Saturday. And I planned on the Monday to come up and try and find a job. 
And I have to admit, I thought, well, I'll, I'll try Blenkinsop because that looked more modern, really, to be honest, than I'd already been to Frank's, hadn't I? So I went to Blenkinsop, but there was nothing going at the time, and he, he sort of said, well, he wanted to employ local men. Anyway, I didn't get on there, so I then went round Alston, and Blagel had closed by that time. I can't remember what happened at Clargo. But anyway, I went to Ale, and John, John Shepherd, he eyed and nowed a little bit, because it was April at the time. Was it April? March. March, I think it would be. And obviously they were slowing down for the summertime. So I went underground um, and had a look round. I, mean, I, bumped, I went onto the face that Squeak was working. I went into his heading. I bumped into Swanee part way in the heading. He was the deputy. But again, there was nothing really going because it'd be, it meant that they'd be top heavy for the summer. So I thought, goodness me, we're running out here. I've only got one place left to go. <laughs> so I came up to Frank's and it wasn't that Frank's was the last on the list. It's just that that's the way I went round. And I parked up walked up onto the pit top and Frank were coming out the cabin and Frank said I was just going to ring you so that's how I ended up here in 1991 it would be just two years after I'd met Frank in the first place and we came to settle 30, 32 years ago now not a bad place is it now rightly or wrongly I'm taking this to be the remains of one of the towers for the aerial flight. Remember from the last video, the aerial flight that came from Blackclough and brought the, uh, the skips down to the railway, to the Olsen branch down at Slaggiford, and it came right across Barrath Park. And these look like some of the remains of the, the supporting pillars for the aerial flight. That's Barra Fall, that's where Dryden lived uh, and it goes back like I said a lot before that. We've got particulars of the estate being up for sale in 1850 where it mentioned obviously the coal pit right up near Horseman's Ford. But when I moved up the hall then, well it was run by Ron and Carol Brack and they were running it as um, like a conference centre where you went to have business conferences or run these different courses and that's what they were running it as. In fact, there was a quite a little bit of conflict when the pit opened that I don't really want to go into because I'm now very good friends with people on both sides and it's 35 years ago. So we're all of us getting a bit older and health problems are all trying to keep alive, not bother with things that went on 35 years ago. But these things happen. That's one of the reasons I moved away from Rosendale because every time somebody wanted to open a pit or a quarry, some form of action group was got up against them. Man, it's getting a bit tired now. It could do with a new coat of paint because it is, it's a lovely building. I always loved the, the Rapunzel Tower at the side of it. In fact, there's, um, the staircase in there is off a liner. It's from a ship. It's like a, not exactly a spiral staircase, but it's one of these big sweeping staircases. Uh, and it is a lovely building. And strangely enough, my first wife, she came to work here. So I was working at the pit and she was working here for quite a while. But when we first moved up, she worked up at the cafe because Frank owned Heartside Cafe then. And I, I'm not sure that Frank didn't build the, the, the stone structure. There had been a cafe there for years, the old Helmwind Cafe, the wooden thing. But I, I think Frank, I'm sure Frank once told me that he, he, did, he built the stone structure. And a lot of the stone came from, um, came from the old smelt mill in Nent. But Barath Park, Barath itself, all around Slaggy for this area, it's a beautiful place. It really is peaceful. It's a, and Barath Park especially, it's a gorgeous place. It must have been a wonderful place to live in the past. And there was also a lime kiln in this field somewhere. I'm not 100% sure where it was. There's no, well, some disturbed ground here. Uh, the Barath pit itself, Barath Colour is on the, the original 1865 map. Um, and it shows the kiln in this field. So again, the pit was just for lime burning, obviously, like most of the Alston pits. Then again, 
This looks favourite. Also, that could be the kiln. A few more remains here, and if you look, we're just you can just see the heap of the Scarberry Drift there. That's on the old um, 1865 map. So maybe this is the kiln, or what's left of it. So this is the original drift that's on the 1865 map that became known as the Scarberry Drift when Dryden reopened it again around about 1907. And go back and have a look at that video and refresh yourselves if you, if you want, otherwise I'll give you a bit of a background. The coal has been worked here, time immemorial, my favourite saying. And if you look all along the road going up to Slaggyford and then up to Nyersdale, you'll see, see where they've been in the hillside nibbling in, just usually for the lime burning. And they went in during the 26th strike as well, I'm told. But this was certainly working properly around about 1907, 1905, 1907, right up till about 1911 when Dryden was running it. Now, the, the, the old colliery came to an end in the 1930s. Uh, and it seems to have stood idle then for 20 years at least. And it was the Curras who came next. Now, I'm sorry I'm a bit sketchy with um, some of the history here with the Curras. Um, it's Norman's dad, um, sadly he's passed now and his mum died last year as well. And Norman was going to try and see if he could find any photographs. And if you're watching Norman, go and have a route. <laughs> so they came back up. There wasn't just the Curras, there was other people involved as well. Uh, oh, Neville Richardson was also here. But they came either the late 50s or early 60s. They finished in 1968 anyway, so it possibly was the 1950s. And again, it was for lime burning because the they had lime works. The, the lime works at North London, that was to do with the place as well. Um, the Curras and the Robsons were intermarried. Uh, I mentioned Tashi Bill when we did the video on the uh, on the kilns as well. So it's the same family. And they had owned Flow Edge, or Flow Edge as it's written, but it's pronounced Flow up here. And the Curras had had Flow Edge, I forget the date offhand, but they'd been there quite a long time as well. Um, then that would pass into Harrison's Lime Works. And I think they'd run into financial difficulties up at Flow Edge. Again, a lot of the coal was going to feed the Lime Works. It went to Croglin for one. And then when Harrison's had it, a lot went to Flusco uh, Lime Works in Penrith, which is now Penrith Tip. But the Curras appear to have had the best out of Barath. When you look at the plans, um, they worked the best patch of it. It's, it's straight, it's all organised. Uh, they didn't seem to hit too many faults. And it looks like, from what I can see, that they had, they had a good go of it. And I know one of them told Frank that they'd had the best out of it. And when they came back, they brought an awful lot of coal out with them. Uh, <laughs> we were going to make it difficult for anybody coming back in. And they ran it until 1968. Well, it's 1968 on the abandonment plan. And I'll put the plan up um, and you can, you, you can have a look at the area that they worked. Bearing in mind, Frank's played about with this plan, plotting where he was going to go around about 1987. And it's coincidental, I suppose, that the Curras also had Flow Edge because Frank had also owned Flow Edge. He'd been in with, uh, at first it was Frank and uh, I think it was Yeti's dad, uh, Mr. Bell. And then it was Frank on his own. And I think Frank was only young. He might only have been 19 or so when he, he started up at Flow Edge, running it himself. I could be wrong with that. Uh, and Frank had been there for a good many years, from certainly the early 1970s to the late 1980s. 86, 87, he will tell me, uh, when he'd sold it, I think he sold it to the Turners. And Frank was operating part of Flow Edge while they were working the main way. And then Tows Bank opened, which is the last sort of semi-anthracite mine, or anthracite mine really, along the South Tyne before the big fault and the, and the true coals come in. And Frank went in there with partnership with uh, Ted Nankara and Sid Armstrong, not Sid Armstrong, Sid's lad. His name will come to me. Willie Armstrong. Sorry, Willie. <laughs> he went in there with Willie Armstrong and Ted Nankara. And Frank was, uh, like he did up at Flow Edge, Frank was operating one drift while the others were working in the other, if you will. And I think Frank was working in the original drift that was on the, the old maps. Anyway, while he was doing that, he, he was getting planning permission 
to come here in the early, in the late 1980s. Uh, I think he started about 1988 here. Memory Lane can be a, a long, windy road and very rocky and bumpy and all, can't it? But believe it or not, I actually drove past here the first time I came. I didn't realise it was a cholera. It was a stipulation of the planning permission, you see. That's what the bugbear was with a lot of pits when they were going to be reopened. Um, lots of action groups thinking it was going to be an eyesore. And to be honest, one of the pits not far from here was, well, it looks like it would have done if I'd have run it. <laughs> uh, but never mind. But to get the pit, to get planning permission, Frank had to build this building here to, um, to hide the plants, really. And it, it was a lot of money to do at the time. It was a lot of uh, debt, really, to get into before you'd turned a cob of coal. But they built it. We've got some photographs of them building it as well. And inside, at the top, obviously it's full of soil now, but at the top was the pit top plant, there was the, the hauler, the tipplers, the screens, and underneath here was where the wagons went in and the coal bunkers were there, that's where they'd drive in. And you can just see the little men's cabin at the side, although there's a story attached to that. <laughs> um, it used to be a different... Anyway, we'll have a look on the pit top and have a look. This is what's left of the pit road. In fact, it was part of the planning permission as well that I think we could only allow one car on site, either one or two cars. There weren't many allowed and there was nowhere to park anyway, really, to be honest with you. And the drift was where that mound is now. That's where the Curras originally put the new drift in, in either the 50s or the 1960s, and that's where Frank came back to. I'll, I'll show you on the plan, but the Curras worked straight forward that way. And Frank's idea... Well, he had a couple of different ideas, but Frank's idea was to go off down towards um, High Row. There's another pit further down the, the, the valley there, along the hillside, called High Row. In fact, there's a fantastic video of that. Newcastle University came in the 1960s for four days, and they did a proper film there. Um, but it's still under copyright, and I used to have a copy, but <laughs> I lent it out and I haven't got it back. But I'll see if I can try and get that film. Fortunately... When I was working here, I did do some video. In 1991, August bank holiday, 31st of August, I came round with a video camera. So it's not the best, and I did go underground with it, but the underground footage was no good. It, you've just got a little cap lamp. But anyway, the, the surface video is well worth a look at, and I'm, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I kept it. But I don't understand why I didn't take more photographs at the time. So this was the pit top, this was the yard. The gates were here, there was actual gates on it. And there was a gantry that came across from there. So the bunkers, the compressor were, were in those buildings there. The, the men's cabin used to be just sat there. Uh, and Frank decided to try and move that. And he, he sort of connected his drot up to it to move it. And it was a right beetle job. It just fell in bits. So then we got this luxurious cabin. Uh, it looks like Andrew's blocked it off. Doors jiggered because I got in last time. This is the height of luxury that we had in the private mines. And today we're going through the uh, broken window. It was quite posh at one time. It had tables in it for us to sit and have our bait, which we never did. Well, that's our sports and social club. And this is where most of the pit top infrastructure was. I'm standing kind of on the, well, we would have been stood on the railway line, the, the tramway lines going in the pit, although it was a lot deeper down. It's all been backfilled, this. Uh, in the shed here is where the uh, hauler was, which was just a diesel winch. It was a main and tail hauler, so there was another hauler in by, run off compressed air. The tippler was here, and the screens. There wasn't really a washing plant here, it was just like a, a hand picking screen getting all the brass off. Because the trouble with the coal here, it was quite brassy, or it had parietes in it. Uh, I wonder if there's a bit laid about, because it was different to ale. Ale you got like slivers of brass within the coal. 
but here you got like eggs they could be from that size right up to the size of your fist and they just take the point off the end of your pick blade like you know what I mean they were murder and obviously they went in the coal and the only other problem that there was <clears throat> the idea of working the Olsen pits was to open up as much ground as possible they were worked by single entry short wall faces that's the official name so you'd have a I'll, I'll draw a diagram for you uh, later on but you'd have a barrowway which was about that wide the word barrowway is a northeastern term because in the old days they actually had a wheelbarrow and either side of the barrowway you go in at coal height five yard either side so the barrowway was high enough well, I say high enough to walk, none of mine ever were. <laughs> the idea, that's where you took your tubs in and out, you had your rails. But the ducket, as they called it, the coal face, called a ducket up here, a back aisle back in the Grime Bridge, you would take at coal height. And the coal here, it varied. It, it was nowhere near as thick as it was uh, at Ale and Clargle. Here, it averaged about 15 to 18 inch. It got a lot lower. I worked in a place, I'll show you a photograph later, that Alan Davis took where it was only a foot high, I've got a foot ruler in. So the coal here was different to what it was uh, down at Al further at Olsen at Hale. The, the saving grace of this place was that it really was dry. But the idea was to open up as much ground as possible. As you drove ahead in, you would turn boards off at 10 metre intervals, because it was a metric pit. And then each board, as you would go over five yard each side as I've said and they would hole into each other so the idea was that you ended up really in effect with a, a long wall face as all the boards advanced together and you get a lot of weight on and that would make the coal a lot easier to work it would bulk off but it never really seemed to happen here say Frank didn't have the best run of things there was lots of faults so Curra's drift went straight in by for quite a long long way but Frank's drift it veered off to the left here, to this side, went this way. And Frank was skirting around their old workings and he, he put a, a return drift in the other side of these trees. These trees were just little saplings. I never thought they'd ever make anything of, of themselves. Uh, they were struggling to survive, look at them now. Anyway, Frank went down there towards the old high row workings where there was a fault and his idea was always to get through that fault. I think it was about a 20 or 30 foot up throw fault um, and take take the coal between Barath and High Row and in fact he had a he had an MCO in, an IMCO, however you want to pronounce it and his first main drift was it really was high and square it had been driven with this MCO kind of thing but it didn't work out, he did get through the fault at one time but it didn't work out so instead he went straight forward where the curras had been and then again went off down towards the left with another drift which ran parallel to this Oh, it was good, you got an air circuit. And then he tried to get up where the curras had left off, but the inspector didn't want him going up there because at the time it was all this radon gas business. They were going mad about radon gas. We'd never heard of it before. Well, I hadn't. It was the same down at Grime Bridge and all these gas meters we had to hang up. They looked like plastic air fresheners. You put in blue loo things, you put in the loo and they were everywhere. It was just radon, radon, radon. And I know it can be a problem. <laughs> but we'd never heard of it at the time. And it, it put paid to a lot of stuff, unfortunately, and it, it put paid to Frank's original plans. And there was a gantry. The gantry heat was here, show it on a picture. And this is where the doorway was that would close. And this is where you went in first thing in the morning underground. And this is where I first came in, the, I would say it'd be the October of 1990, looking for a job. One Saturday morning, uh, my wife had gone off to try and find us somewhere to live. Uh, and I'd come here for an half day and we were working with Kieran Thompson and his brother Charva Thompson and I'd never heard the, the nickname Charva, it's common up here isn't it, I just kept calling him Charlie all day and they were working driving the main way but they got a long wall face on up the side, well a short long wall face, they were about 10 metres in uh, and they got a, a bo what they call a box, like a slusher box, so you would fill, the, you would hew the coal and throw it back and the slusher box would bring it out to the barrowway. So it was usually, they were working it with three men, I think. There was Kieran and Chava and Terry, Terry Page, which was then Frank's, uh, Frank's son-in-law, would be operating the box. Uh, compressed air, you know, <laughs> it would run on, uh, on rope. It wouldn't even be wire rope. It could have been wire rope. I can't remember the one we had now. Um, but it was operated by baler twine. So you had two bits of, bits of baler twine right up the coal face. Pull one way 
for the box to go out and pull it the other way to reverse the motor and get the box to come in the other way. They're all high tech. Although Frank did make a coal cutter for here as well. We've got a photograph of that. Well, I did manage to find a piece of brass. Here you are. That's what the brass looks like. You can see it's like an egg, well not egg shaped, but you get the idea. And that's hidden in the coal and that would very easy take the end off your pick blade. And if you only had two or three blades, you could sharp do without that. And if that went on the fire, even bits of that, because most of this coal went for like park rays and ray burns, that's what the, the Olsen anthracite was good for. I know I said it was semi-anthracite before. They class it as semi-anthracite because it has a certain amount of carbons or something in it, but it's not. It's, it, for all intents and purposes, it's anthracite. You can't burn it on an open fire. It just doesn't want to know. So it is a fantastic coal. It really is a fantastic coal. It smells a little bit of sulphur when you open the fire grate, you know, when you were taking the box out, but it's mad hot. I mean, we lived on it as soon as we bought that little cottage in uh, Slaggiford. We, uh, we turned it all into solid fuel central eating. And I tell you what, we were never cold in that house. It was fantastic coal. But I was only here for three years. I came and started in April, I think it was the 15th or the 13th of April in 19, 1991. And I had to finish in 1994. Because 1994 was the time that the coal mines, the pits, the National Coal Board, or British Coal as it then was, was defunct. That was it. The collieries were denationalised. Yeah, after less than 50 years they were denationalised. And so all these little collieries, all the little private mines, they were all on worked on licence through then British Coal <clears throat> and they came under an umbrella insurance of British Coal so now there was no British Coal and the insurance companies were going to have a field day the, the prices for insuring men was going to be astronomical and it became that it wasn't it made some of the, these little pits unviable because Thing, the economics hadn't been going well. There was a recession, if you remember, in the uh, 1990s at the time. In fact, it was around about the time of the, uh, the conflict in, um, in Yugoslavia. So after being on the dole for, I think it was just a week, and again I tried full on late blanking stop where the, it really was big money. Uh, I got on at John's at Ale and I was there for another nine years. Now I know I keep banging on about the view, but it is gorgeous looking down. This is the South Tyne. And when I was working here, these trees weren't mature at all. I can't even think if they were planted at the time. But you used to come out the pit some days and just look at that view. Uh, and it was brilliant coming out of there at half past three, three o'clock, three o'clock it was, three o'clock I was. Uh, and just looking down there on a summer's day, beautiful. I wish the sun was shining a bit now. And they used to do all the, used to get a lot of low-flying aircraft with the RAF training up here. You'd get a lot of the Hercs coming down and also the fighters that were practicing coming up and down the South Tyne. And on more than one occasion I was looking down at the pilot from up here. That's what it used to be like. Well Barath is really historically important for, for one good reason and it's never mentioned. It's not in any of the history books and nobody goes on about it. But I think it really is important and I think it's a historic landmark that people have missed. We talked about in a video 12 months ago that we did about the, uh, the floods and the, the three children that was killed in, in Rochdale at Norden at Black Pits. And the events that had happened at Silkston on the same day had led to the Shasper report, hadn't it? and the investigation into women and children working underground. And the results of that report and that inquiry were that in, on the 1st of January 1843, all women, girls and boys under the age of 10 were banned from working underground. So that was 1843. Now while I was here, like I said, the, the, the nationalization was undone, they, they got denationalized, but also that law about women working underground was also reversed. And the very first woman to legally, legally, work underground, again, in a British coal mine, was here at Barath. And it was Angela Elliott. And she was certainly working here long after I finished as well. And Angela and Frank are together. So she was helping her partner out, really, wasn't she? But she was the first woman legally back underground 
in over 150 years and I think that's a really important piece of history that nobody really picks up on. And further down the road at Ale Colliery, well the last, I think, and I'm almost sure, the last working Bevin boy was still working there and it was Lenny Boylan and Lenny was working there till, I can't remember what date he finished, it was certainly before the year 2000 but it was sometime after 1995, it, it, it was probably the late 90s when Lenny finished. So that's interesting, the last Bevin boy and the first woman underground. And a little bit later I'll show you, many of you will remember, ex pitmen will remember the coal news that we used to get at the pit. Well when Budge took over the coal industry, he brought out a newspaper like the coal news. I forget the name I found, was it News Scene? But anyway, I've got some copies at home and I'll dig them out and we'll show you. Uh, and there used to be a little paragraph in each one of those women in mining and it was always like Maureen that worked in the stores or Brenda on accounts well here it was Angela Elliott who was working on the slusher box and on the hauler she actually did properly work undergrounded Angela and she did a good job of it as well now I did try to get Angela to come on <laughs> on the camera but she's too shy but some people have mixed views about it about women working underground and um, there was Somebody put a post up not long ago, it could have been uh, Dennis and then lasses in America working underground. Uh, people have views about it, I can't see a problem with it really. I mean how many women work on the London Underground? Yeah, they're not working on the coal face but back by, <laughs> not a lot of difference is there. Like I said back in the, um, in the Suffer Little Children video, a lot of the women and kids went in the mills and the Lancashire women went working in the mills. And if you think what it was like working in a weaving shed or a spinning, spinning room, it was just as dangerous as working in a pit. Uh, and it was equally as uncomfortable. Red hot, humid. Um, the noise, especially in a weaving shed, was unbelievable. Constantly, for eight hours a day, every day, five days a week, dusty conditions. So that's my take on that. Obviously, the conditions they're working in today are an awful lot different to what they were in 1840 and rightly women and children were banned then yeah that's right I'm not advocating that one bit so ever but this day and age well they seem to have banned the blokes underground as well haven't they there used to be a car mill here at one time and if you look on the old maps there isn't even a bridge here and there's also a natural passage from the underground caverns at El Burn mine that comes out again at the side of the brook here and brings the water from the, uh, the old zinc mine well, from the natural caverns there anyway So I said I'd explain how they mined the coal or I used to mine the coal, we all mined the coal up on Alston Moor the little limestone seam now, I'm sorry about this geology lesson, it's going to be a bit like coming back home from the pub in the 80s after five or six pints and putting on the Open University. But here we've got an end elevation of a working board. There's your solid coal, that's the roof, and there's the floor, and these are the rails. Now, as you notice, the coal's up on the roof, uh, and usually the roof is taken down, ripped down to enlarge the roadways, but on Alston Moor, it's different. They take the floor up to enlarge the roadways. They used to take the roof down, uh, but it is far better for roof control to take the bottom up. Um, so this, where the coal is left on, is called a canche. So the method is known as bottom canche. If you were taking the top down, it would be top canche, and that would then be the canche up there. So there's the rails. There's the solid coal. That's where the hewer will be working. See, he's a good lad, he's got his timbers up. And this is a stone pack. So all the stone that has been taken down from here or blown up from there has been packed on the side and a stone wall built. That is to support the road as it advances and the weight comes on. Now, usually coal has a grain, it has a cleat. Uh, it's like going to be in q and getting yourself a, a plain bit of 3B2. And you see that one side has a grain, turn it on its edge, uh, and the grain is different, it's, the, it's what's known as the end and it's very hard to work on the end well coal is usually the same that's why you've got board and pillar because there's a board or a cleat to the coal however the Alston coal, the little limestone, is different 
it's actually called corn in corn there's a the roof and the floor and it's got breaks in it in a cone shape so it's like inverted the coal seam is made up of inverted cones those are the natural breaks within the coal and when there's no weight on the coal it can be extremely hard it can be really hard to work and in fact even when a bit of weight starts to come on just imagine you get yourself a, a raw hen's egg and you grip it and you can grip it really tight can't you and nobody's going to get it out of your hand but it, if you can just increase that grip more boom it bursts open and it's the same principle with getting weight on the coal. Sometimes it can just nip it, so it makes it even harder. And your, your pig steel's coming out glowing red. Your heart's breaking, and it's like drops of blood. Then you get enough weight on, and the fractures open. Forgive my drawings. So the, the hue will come along in here, and the angle of that is known as a back. You'd say, oh, the coal's very backy. So he'd get his blade in the top, and that would literally just fall off. Then he'd be into the bottom, get that out, and he'd have another backer coming back and getting that out. And in fact, sometimes a coal can actually burst off. Uh, and for a start, it's a bit unnerving when it, a lot of weight comes on the coal because you're getting loud bangs out of the strata as, as, uh, as everything's getting crushed. And as I said, sometimes big lumps can burst off. And I even got a black eye once. So that's the idea to get everything opened up. So now we're looking at a coal face from above. I've just been lazy and only drawn the bar away that, but it will go all the way down there to a heading that ran at uh, 90 degrees to it. This is a solid coal. It's the last line of timbers. And this is where the stone has been packed. It's called a gob. Some place it's called a gulf or a waste. You can see the stone pack and there's the rails. Now to advance the road for a start, the hewer will just drive straight forward about four foot wide for a depth of about six feet, two meters maybe. And that's what's known as a sump. And when he's put that on, he will then put a drill a hole in the floor, fill it full of explosives or might, and then fire it. And in the words of Blue Peter, here's one we made earlier. This has been sumped. That's your sump. You see how he's advanced it? That's where the coal's already been taken out. And there's the canch. So what he'll do now, he'll drill a hole at the bottom of the canch with the whirler drill, fill it full of mite, and then fire it. There you are, that's where he is with his drill. Uh, actually, this has already been fired. It looks like he's left a bit on the bottom and uh, he's gonna fire the rest up. But can you see how it's fired the stone out now? And you've got solid coal to go out, that's his next week's work. But it's not exactly fired perfect, so he's gonna to have to hack up with the pick as well. And can you see where he's built his pack either side? It's been a, it's a bit of a fisheye lens that, <laughs> it's not bowed like that as a rule. Well, that, that's the borer or the whirler with his, uh, with the rod, it's a long rod, that and all. And here, we've uh, started to take the coal off the side. Can you see? He's got his sets of gears in up, up uh, the northeast and round Olsen. Two props and a bar are known as a set of gears. That's something I had to learn. Uh, so you take a few tubs off the side and get your gears up. Now, as you start setting your side away, you can get, you can see it's awkward. Uh, and you, <laughs> it's hard to get laid, as you say, laid in proper. And the, the guy might have a leg and a foot against that side of the canch and a foot against that side of the canch doing a balancing act then when he gets laid in when he's got a couple of tubs off then he's laid down for the rest of the day now the, the thing is for most good hewers or uh, even a bad hewer you've got to be able to hew on both shoulders you've got to be ambidextrous uh, otherwise you're going to get yourself into some problems you see there he's got his timbers in there's a pick lid on the canch. It gives you a high, an idea of how high it is. The pan shovel just about goes in. And the coal, when you're setting the side away, just drops into the bar away there. <laughs> and it lands on your foot. I'm telling you now, it's heavy. It hurts. So if you go back to our plan view now, you can understand what this what this means. I was trying to set the side away. Well, he has set the side away here. And he's going to take that pillar of coal out for a distance of five yards or five meters. Up, up what they call a duck it up here till he gets to where there's another board 
and his ducat. So both ducats would meet each other. And the, the center of the heading of the boards would be about 12 meters. Then when you've taken all that side of call out, you'll then start taking this side out. And when there was no machines, when there was no cutters being used, just normal hand hewing, you would generally get a week out of one one shot, uh, as long as you went forward fair enough. It'd take you uh, half a day on the shot, certainly half a day something, and you'd have two days up either side. So you can see now on the Barath plan, this is the original plan of Curras, when Curras were using it, how that works out. There's your main way going in. And every so many yards, could be 50 yards, could be 70 yards, they take a heading across. And every 10 yards, they drive a barrow way in. And all these barrow ways will be holed together. The, the ducats will go one into the other. So you end up with a long wall face. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's going to be about 100 yard, 100 yard face thereabouts. Um, so that's how we, you would work the call going in. I can say this is the old Barrow pit, and this is where Frank's done all his plotting and planning, uh, how he's going to get round their workings this way, and he wants to be up here. And this is a plan of Barrow in uh, 1991. I'd only been there a few months, and this is where Frank has come in. There's Curra's drift going that way, and see Frank came down towards this side, going down towards High Row. And these are his workings here, as he's trying to get through and get past their workings. Although here there's a fault comes in, and this is where, Frank, we're going to try and get up into this patch of coal that's left between Barrow and uh, High Row. And when I first started, that was what I started. My first day was up this duck at here, Robin, <laughs> um, which wasn't my favourite job. I was a long way over. And I think the, the morning I managed to get two tubs and came out of bed and Frank must have thought he'd set the bi biggest wazak on there was in the Olsen coal field. But anyway, I went back in after bed and I started sumping and I got five out of the sump. So that was pretty respectable. And then that was my first heading going up there, taking the airway. So I hope that explains a little bit how we uh, mined the coal on Alston Moor. So let's have a trip down memory lane and look at some of the photographs we've got of the pit. And this is this takes us right back to before Frank started, just as operations were going. So this is how the curras left it. There's the, the, the drift would be up there. Um, this is before the building was built, obviously, in prelude to putting the footings down. And everything's kind of in full swing here. Getting on with the building, you can see the work that went into it um, and what it entailed. It was like building a house. It, it, it wasn't cheap. Like I said, putting the, the pit in quite a lot of considerable debt before they'd even started. I first ventured up there in the July, August of 1989. And this is the site that I found. Those tubs are really historically significant as well because they come from the Settling Stones mine um, towards... Um, over towards Four Stones and Hexham, and Settling Stones was the, the country's last witherite mine. So again, this is the gantry going in. This is now just a mound of earth. We have the main drift, which was just constructed of Anderson shelters, and I'm taking that to be exactly the same as when the Curras had it, uh, but this is obviously when Frank was working it. It's quite common with a lot of the private mines to use the old Anderson shelters as the, the drift mouth all over the country, in fact. You can see there the, the haulage signals going in at the side. And this is the same day, as I say, when I first came up whilst on holiday. There's Frank himself, a lot younger than he is these days. And that was his then son-in-law, Terry Page, who was drawing. And it was interesting, just as a side thing, Terry's grandma was from Crochet Booth and he actually knew some of the lads I grew up with. So I love coincidences like that. So we had a trip in and uh, both Frank and Terry were driving the main way. Uh, th at that time, they were they were on the top canch. You see the height of coal there, it's about 17 inch thereabouts. And there's Frank with a with a full tub. Those settling stones tubs held about 400 weight. You can just see the face there, the coal face under the canch. So that was the main road, so it was driven really high. 
And later on, the drift mouth was changed. The uh, the old Anderson shelter was well, it was still there, but changed. And that is where Frank also went down that side there. But at this present time, we were going straight forward in for about 100 yards and then turn off down to the right. And we've moved on now from away from the settling stone tubs to the standard old NCB tub. And these weighed, well, these held about 600 weights. Um, and it was average for each bloke thereabouts to, to fill about 40 a day, 40 a day, 40 a week, sorry. And this is a view down onto the pit top. The drift's running in, in there. The hauler and tipplers are there. And you went in here and you got your your grinders and things like that and down some steps to get into the bunkers. Uh, there's the compressor, two compressors in case one broke down. There's a side view of it all. Um, you see our, the new cabin that's still there now. Uh, that's, like I say, where the grinder was and where there was stuff for fixing things, workbenches and what have you, pile of timber that was used, and that was Frank's loading shovel. It's a shame this is out of focus, really. That's Stephen Shepherd. That was one of Frank's sons uh, standing at the gantry, just about to go into the drift mouth. And I wish I had taken a lot more photographs underground. Uh, I had another one of Kieran running the hauler, which I've sadly, sadly got lost. That's a shame. So most of the photographs I've got underground have been taken by other people. And this was taken by Alan Davis, uh, then of the... Salford Mining Museum. So thanks for this, Alan. And this is part of the pit top setup. There's the diesel hauler. That's the stone tippler. The coal tippler was just back by on this side here. Uh, and it took coal out the box up onto here, up this conveyor belt. And that there is the jigging screen. And they would stand at the side of that and pick all the brass off. And the coal would naturally fall into the bunker. Beans, well, duff, beans and uh, lumps. So most of these were taken, actually, in the last month or so I was there. And this is on the, the driving the then main way up on the face. That's me. So that will be 1994, around about June time. Uh, we, had a, we had the box on that face. So we only took one side out, but we were over about 10 metres. You can see the bale of twine there. That's for operating the box, for pulling it in and out. There's the coal face and the, the gob to the side. You can see how high it is, uh, or how high it isn't. In fact, talking about how high it isn't, this was taken just a couple of years earlier by Alan Davis. That's me again, and that is actually a foot ruler on the canch. So it was a foot between <laughs> between the floor and the roof. Um, that's a, a, as it was, and if people believe don't believe you can work in that, well, when you've got a mortgage to pay and that's the amount of coal you've got, you've got to work in there. In fact, the pit further up at Tows Bank, if they had a foot of coal sometimes, they were, they were well off. <laughs> so back to 1994 uh, and the, the box face. This is actually in the barrow way, now in the main way. That chute was to help the coal get off the canch uh, and into the tub. That, that's the end of the box there. Um, obviously, you didn't bring the box right out into the barrow way. So sometimes you had to help give it a hand shoveling into the tub as well and you see the uh the bale of twine there and that's the rope to a little haulage engine a little air hauler there and and it wasn't wire rope you can tell it's like it's just blue rope isn't it and that's uh, the shoot again looking at it from the the face side this time and that's jimmy tuck who come on a trip and these photographs were taken by Hanko venk who came visiting uh he very kindly left us a, a can of lager on the canch. But again, you can see the, the rope there for the box to operate the box. So again, it's the same day. That's me, and that's Jez Cooper, who you'll maybe all know as the last pitman. And me and Jez at that time comprised the entire workforce, apart from Frank. This guy came with Jimmy and um, Hanko as they were coming in taking photographs. You can actually notice the roof bars as well. Can you see? There are motorway crush barriers that were used, and they also used them at L. And that was taken by Jimmy Tuck. That's that's me sharpening a blade after the after work on the grinder. That'd be about 1992, I would think. Now, following denationalisation, uh, 
the private mines also had to provide rescue men, so part of the workforce had to be fully trained up. Uh, and at Barath, there was only Jez and Frank working there by this time, so Jez was trained up as a rescue man. So 50% of the workforce were rescue men, and the other 50% were deputies. So this is Jez, and this is Kieran Thompson, and that's Tony Goff from we're at the uh, Halton Rescue Station there at Haltonly Springs. And Kieran had been Frank's brother-in-law at one time, and Kieran had worked on and off at Barath. He'd been at all the, I don't think he was out of any pits he hadn't been at in Alston Moor. And I said Frank had made his own cutter, and this is him manufacturing it. I don't know what date this would be, it'd be, I don't know, 90, 97, 98. And this is the coal cutter, that's his jib. And he ended up bringing that. I'm sure he brought Mark to of that to uh, Ale when he came. They've got a, a better look at the, the workings of it. I mean, most of the mine owners uh, and, and the sons and everybody could put their hands to everything you had to do in, in, the, in the little pits. It was make, do and mend and manufacture your own gear. The money just wasn't there really to buy a lot of equipment. Well, that's a good look at some of the photographs. So let's have a look at the video now from 19, 1991. find a copy of new scene and that's from August of 1995 there we are first page as I said women in mining so I've talked about a slusher box or a, a scraper box and this is what one actually looks like this is one that was used at Ale the one at uh, Barrow wasn't quite as big as this now, sadly, Barrow Colliery came to an end in the summer of 2000, the year 2000. And at the time, there were only really Frank and Jez working there. The coal had really thinned out. Um, it was a bad time in the coal trade. and There was no profits to be made anymore. Uh, and there was changes coming as well, further changes coming. So Frank sadly decided to call it a day. Uh, and he ended up coming to Ale Colliery for quite a while, as did Jez. Jez used to come during the summertime as well at Ale and became a partner later on. So thanks for watching. Um, and it's only a small little North Pennine pit, but it was locally an important mine. And the people involved in it were big people within the local coal industry. They've been involved all their lives. So I hope you've enjoyed this view into a private mine in the North Pennines. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.